The Wheeling Plant Commission meeting for Thursday, January 17th is called to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Johnson, could you, Mr. Secretary, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Burns. Here. Commissioner Dorband. I'm here. Commissioner Johnson, that's me, I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Schaff gave prior notice that he would not be in attendance. Commissioner Stylin. Here. And Chairman Rafato. Here. Mr. Jennings, any changes to the agenda? Nope. We have no citizen concerns. We have no consent items. We have no items for review, and so let's go move to other business. Mr. Jennings. Thank you. At Last week's uh, Planning Commission hearing, there was a request uh, to use this week's uh, open agenda to discuss parking requirements. Um, we have <coughs> compiled this as a, a two-part discussion. Um, it's heavier on the commercial. We'll start with commercial, uh, then we'll probably uh, take a break um, so that uh, we can switch over to the residential side. Um, before I get started with this, I think there, there's going to be a fairly significant amount of data uh, in this. There's a fairly significant amount of um, uh, dry analysis. I'm going to try to to move through some of it. If you have questions, feel free to uh, to stop me. Um, it's not a very formal presentation. Um, and, and the last thing I want to say before I start with this is that the, the parking is um, part science and part art. Uh, it is not, uh, it's not exact. The, the numbers that we use are uh, similar to other towns. They're based on years worth of data in these types of communities. Um, they are not meant to be a perfect projection. They are meant to be the uh, best estimate uh, based on a wide um, uh, universe of sampled businesses. So uh, with that, um, I will get started. <clears throat> so the, the basic structure of this, we're going to go through some of our uh, parking requirements in general. Uh, we have in the last eight years um, done a few parking related amendments. I'll give a brief overview of that and then I'll go into uh, commercial parking before we take a break and hand it over to Ms. Jones on residential. <coughs> Hello. This is a recycled slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Parking regulations in general. Um, we Generally speaking, the parking requirements for a given development are based on the, uh, the excuse me, the parking requirements for a village are based on the character of the development and the availability of public parking. Uh, that's going to be one theme that you'll hear a couple of times through this, through this discussion. Um, and as I said before, it's part art, part science. What you're attempting to do is balance supply and demand. You want to get the number right. You don't want to be too far under. You don't want to be too far over. Uh, there is a cost on, uh, there is an impact on the cost of doing development, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. A, a parking requirement has the ability, whether intentional or unintentional, to shape development. It can encourage certain types of development, certain types of businesses. It can discourage certain types of development. Um, the, the economic development impact um, should be viewed as very real. It, it is 
the, the cost of providing parking is a real cost. The construction of parking, whether surface or structure, is, is one aspect of that. You also have the opportunity cost. The more parking per building you require proportionally, the less building you can require you can build on the same site. Um, retailers do look at availability of parking. They look at availability of on-site parking, off-site parking. Uh, it is one of the many factors they take a look at. They look at demographics very heavily, uh, traffic, how much traffic is there on a site, uh, in front of a site, um, how many people with an income of $100,000 or more are there within a quarter mile, a half mile, a mile. Um, the, the retailers, though, is if you look at their site selection criteria, have a huge range. Similar restaurants have different needs. And, and this is why we use numbers that are generalized and spread across an entire uh, very large sample sizes. One restaurant will say, I need, you know, I need to seat uh, X number of people, and I require parking for one out of every two seats. The next restaurant will say one out of every four seats. Um, some of these individual retailers' requirements are going to be more than our parking code requires. Some will be less. Uh, the, the site selection criteria, though, as I said, is, uh, is a long list, a very long list. Um, Andrew, could you go, yes. go, <coughs> go back to the previous slide? Driven by character of development and availability of public parking. Yes. So public parking, what does that mean? The parking regulations in a, in a given municipality are going to be based on the style of the area. How, how likely is it that people will walk in the mode split? How, how many people will take the train to get to this store? Uh, the parking requirements in a very dense area uh, tend to be non-existent because there's a much higher uh, percentage of non-driving, uh, non-personal vehicle driving. So that's one part of it. Availability of public parking, even in the suburban setting, uh, towns that have public parking available adjust their parking requirement based on proximity to public parking. So in, in the terms of public parking, it's um, uh, covered parking that would be in a downtown area. Um, is street parking depends, considered? Is street you know, parking considered public parking? It's it's town by town. Uh, it's really how is the how is the municipality built up? Uh, Lagrange has parking off of its main retail strips. It's all it's mm, seventy percent surface parking. They have a couple of public lots. They built one pretty recently, um, attached to a public library. Um, you go to the Glen. There's street parking, and then there is structured parking off the street. Um, so towns that have a significant amount of public parking or a downtown area with a significant amount of public parking will have a different set of regulations in those, in those locations. Um, we took a look at Glenview and Arlington Heights have even, um, uh, the proximity to those structures is written into the code. They'll say any, anything within 350 feet of this has a different parking requirement. Um, and that's, that's uh, we also saw regulations that have, um, uh, you have a, a downtown type of character. There may be one parking requirement on the first floor and a different parking requirement for the upper floors. Um, part of it is because of the availability of parking. The other side of it is to encourage use of the upper floors. But thank you. But, but I guess if I can just add, right, <coughs> do, does that include pushing uh, commercial parking off into residential areas? Now, some places, some cities where uh, LaGrange, you, you mentioned, right, a lot of that parking is on street parking, and they're outside of a, a lot or two. There, there is no other place to go. But right. if you're... If you're building a new uh, entity, right? Would you strive to commit that off-street public parking in residential areas into that uh, calculation or just say that that's an emergency type overflow? What, 
It, it depends again on the area. I mean, a really dense urban area um, may have different ways of dealing with it. Uh, you may do uh, very spe uh, specific um, block by block residential permits. Um, I would say more typical in the suburban setting. You would only see these types of varying parking regulations if there's a structure or a dedicated surface lot. I, I don't think that most of most of them uh, calculate the street parking into it. Uh, there are some exceptions. We did see uh, Glenview had on-street parking, uh, but the on-street parking <coughs> was very specific that it was along the commercial streets. It was along uh, Glenview Road, I believe, along Waukegan Road. Um, but no. as far as I can tell, I haven't seen anything where the where you're, this scenario you're describing. Okay, so that that's kind of generic. How about specific to Wheeling? When we built uh, the uh, Schwinn uh, Staples area, right? We I think we went out of our way to do everything possible to prohibit uh, <coughs> parking in the neighborhood. Uh, yes. immediately north of uh, the center. We built a, a berm that was very high and very street, steep sides to try and prohibit right uh, uh, that kind of uh, parking. And I'm not sure what happened over at, uh, uh, at the other center by Fresh Farms, right? But I'd, I'd like to hear you say that for wheeling we don't we don't design for having uh, public uh, residential parking included in the calculation. It is not part of the calculation. Okay. The, the Schwinn thing, while we're on that, the Schwinn thing is actually, it, it not only was a berm, but the, the developer in the village originally had anticipated a walkway through the berm so that the residential area could at least walk and the residents said, no, we don't want to be able to walk through that berm. And uh, it was removed. So there is no, the, it's totally disconnected from that neighborhood. But I think they were afraid that uh, there might, you might get some parking up there. And if it was convenient to walk, <coughs> at least that's my recollection. Yeah, that, that, was, that, that, was, right. the, that was the fear. That was, that was the fear. <coughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> is just about the <coughs> funniest story that I've had in my time here. The, the woman who spoke so uh, eloquently against that cut through in the berm um, prevented her own neighborhood from being connected to the shopping center. Her daughter later crashed her car through the front window of one of the stores there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. She had to drive. And that was funny because it wasn't your no daughter was or injured. your it store. Was a, it was a, it was, <laughs> no one was injured. Funny after the fact. That she could have walked there. Yes. I, ironic. I ironic guess. is more. <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we, f we finished this one. Are there any questions? Yes, we did finish. Um, without going too far into this, uh, most of you have been on this commission for most of these changes. Um, in, I guess the point of this is to show that for the most part, uh, there are not that many changes to the parking. We've, we've changed a couple of specific uses here and there. There's been minor changes. Uh, but just about everything that's happened since 2005 is shown on this slide. So uh, we do take changes to the parking requirements pretty seriously. We, we try to study them thoroughly when we when we propose a change um, and and the other point of the slide is to show that for the vast majority of our shopping centers uh, they were built under the same regulations and what we've done mostly is just recalculate how the uh, the um, the reuse of the space uh, would be figured um, and, and that's and that's what the uh, the next slide will discuss. We haven't had up until 2005 the parking regulations for the village had gone more or less on a, on a steady flow. There were not many changes for a long time. Uh, the, the general policy up until that point also was that 
Um, shopping center parking was equal to the sum of the tenants in the, in the shopping center. Uh, that's more or less the case today. Um, we did end up through that with a lot but of... But that, that takes, if you have a new shopping center, you're, you're, you are making a, an assumption as to what's going to be in the spaces. You, yes, you make an assumption as to what's going to be in the spaces. Uh, in the end, once it's fully leased, um, if that assumption was wrong, you may need a variation for a particular unit. Uh, and then through, at that point, you go through the, the standards on a case-by-case -case basis. Which is no different than today. No, no different than today. Okay. And, Essentially. And, we'll get into some of what is different. Andrew, when was the 25% uh, reduction introduced? That was, let's see. Um, 2007, July of 2007. And, and do you know what calculations the uh, Schwinn Center were made under? Was that under the 25% reduction? No. It was uh, um, prior to that. It was, I it was think, a variation. 2005. Yeah. Did they have a variation? If they had a couple, they had a variation for a number of buildings and a lot. I think they had a variation because at the time, they were not sure exactly what they they had. They knew that TGI Fridays was going to be there, so it had a very high parking requirement. And I think they knew maybe one of the two restaurants and had already one of the two in cap restaurants and had already projected ahead to get a variation for one of those. So I think it had some amount of variation for parking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but then, I, if you recall, though, the next door neighbor uh, right. con was considered a, a potential overflow. Right. Even area. though there yes. was no An agree no agreement. No agreement. They specifically exactly. would not agree to it. Right. But but they but it was there. It was, existed. Target would not. Right. Target would not sign a uh, right cooperative. Is that still true? Yes. That's still true. Every time I park there in that uh, Target lot and go to Fridays, I'm uh, You run criminal. the risk that somebody is watching you. But most <laughs> likely, nothing like uh, However, if they tow you away, you may never shop at Target again. So. <laughs> yeah. So, right. <laughs> There's a Walmart across the street. Right. Sorry. Um, so 2005 to 2007, uh, those of you who were on the commission at the time would remember that we did, we did a lot of analysis based on uh, varying peak demands. We did a lot of <clears throat> looking at the tenant mix and very specifically, tenant by tenant, what hours were they open? And during those hours, was it employees, customers, mix? Um, and we did, uh, with each variation, they, they did tend to be, to be our smallest shopping centers during that time period. It seemed to be having more of the small restaurants coming into them. So a lot of our analysis was, uh, was based on um, alternating peak demand. Um, that was also the time where we started looking at whether or not new shopping centers should come in with a spec requirement to give them a little bit of padding in their numbers. Um, let's see, we were on to the current regulations. It's similar to the, to the previous case uh, <clears throat> prior to 2005 in that it remains mostly tied to the sum of the tenant requirements. Uh, we do have the, the spec requirement now. So that, uh, the speculative requirement is intended to provide some uh, additional parking under the assumption that not every unit is going to be a straight retail unit at four <coughs> spaces per thousand. Um, out of a general shop, a typical shopping center, maybe one or two of those units will be a higher uh, intensity use uh, <coughs> restaurants, fitness, hair salon, that sort of thing. Um, in a small strip center, there is no reduction permitted. Um, it, the smaller the center, the less opportunity there is for uh, turnover on the vehicles. There's just not, not uh, enough volume of uh, uh, on-site parking. The medium shopping center, the current regulation uh, for a medium-sized shopping center, uh, allows up to a 15% reduction uh, from what the sum of the tenants would be. Um, we set recently the absolute minimum, so that regardless of what the sum of the tenants is, you still have a minimum square, uh, square footage requirement. And then the large shopping centers, we allow up to a 25% uh, reduction 
and again we set very recently I think um, August the uh, absolute minimum of 3.25 Andrew can we can you give us an example for uh, the large shopping center I mean again if we go back to fresh farms can can you give us an example of what the requirement would have been if it if no reduction had been issued and then the impact of the 25 percent and then the correction factor how much what kind of delta did that really make to uh, I think we are we're gonna have that pop up I think on the next few slides okay um, so I'll then, be patient <laughs> the uh, when we look at analyzing the parking regulations trying to figure out are they good is it working um, we, we're looking at a, a few a few things here this is not you know standard this is just what we talked about um, so the first part of that is which shopping centers appear to be the most congested uh, based on perception does it seem when you visit a shopping center that it has uh, a low availability of parking and um, and then you know before you get into the numbers uh, I, I don't know if you guys have experience with any particular shopping center but just think think of them uh, before we move ahead of which ones seem uh, seem to be congested which ones seem to be uh, lacking parking um, and then uh, we look at how does the actual demand uh, compare with the code why why is there a discrepancy if there is a discrepancy uh, number three if the, if the speculative requirement um, in our case we do have a speculative requirement is it an accurate projection from the construction to what the ultimate tenant mix is going to be at that shopping center did does the speculative average this five and a half per thousand does it do a good job of covering uh, the future build out of that shopping center and then uh, the fourth is is the reduction that we we added back in 2007 uh, correct in terms of the percentage that it allows and the threshold at which we started so the, the uh, if you've gone ahead and thought of the, the shopping centers that seem congested we go on to the next question is how does the actual demand compare with the code ratios um, make the distinction here before we move forward between the parking usage and the ratios the the requirement is again based on uh, trends you know what does the typical restaurant require um, and our, our parking is designed to to do a, a, a good job of uh, of providing for that um, but there is a difference between usage and ratio some restaurants with the same number of seats use more parking it's just the way that it is um, generally what we find is that large centers have a variety of tenants and are therefore better equipped to handle uh, uh, this idea of shared parking the bigger the shopping center is the more parking it has and the more different types of tenants it has they are less likely to overlap in their peak demand plus they have the ability if they do overlap that people there are more spaces to begin with and the turnover is easier to handle people are able to find a spot uh, more easily um, what you're looking at on the bottom here is the uh, standard parking requirement which is the sum of the uses at the shopping centers and what we did was we took shopping centers of varying uh, ages and varying tenant mixes varying locations so these are not all in one spot they're not all on one street they weren't all built in the same decade and they aren't all the same size uh, just as a sample the table is getting too big so um, the, uh, the okay so if you yes. could just go through the first line Riverside Plaza Riverside Plaza at about 70,000 square feet is required to buy our the standard code this is what this this is this the standard requirement uh, would be required to have 381 stalls it actually has 266 
So it is, as this indicates, this column indicates, it is 115 spaces short of meeting the requirement of the sum of its tenants' needs. So if you add up all of the tenant spaces in that shopping center, each one, when you total up the column, uh, the, 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 uh, the total is 381. That, that part so far so good? Mm -hmm. Question though. Yes. I mean, if, if you take a look at Riverside, it has a, I'll say, a northern, northeasterly facing section, and then there's another building that's more on the west side that has a side on the south side and it has a <coughs> side on the, the north side. Mm -hmm. And do, when you go through your calculations, do you consider the entire center? Because if you look at, there's more than adequate parking on the northeasterly facing side, but on the south side, it's jam-packed. And uh, many times you can never find a parking spot. And you I mean, don't know if, if people- You mean opposite, Riverside Plaza is across the street from right so what you're saying is opposite really the south side has got most of the parking the stuff that faces no well dundee the the one the one that's facing dundee R are we, wait riverside is the center on the south east corner of milwaukee yes yeah. the, the Eduardo's south, pizza yeah but there's two sections. Right. There's a section to the west and a and section, a section to, the to the east. And there's and also there's a, a little one to the south. south. To the south. And the right. south is right. always packed. No, the south is always. So I don't see the south being packed all the I, time. No. South is always open. I think oh, it's open. I, boy, when I had to go in there for my uh, physical therapy sessions, it was packed. I mean, it's all doctor's offices and. A really? physical therapist when and stuff was, like now, that. How, how, how recently was this? It was probably a, a year or so really? ago. Oh, see, now I was there a couple years ago, and I, I didn't experience the same thing. Or maybe it's the time of day that you went. Anyway. I mean, but, that, but but so, so the answer is no. We don't, we don't look at it. We would look at it, I think, at the time of construction. Um, you know, we obviously were not here during during the review of that one, but I think we would look at distribution of parking at, at the original site plan review. Do you have, um, you take the example of, uh, of Riverside, are the large units that would tend to be restaurants located in a place that has uh, limited availability of parking? Um, so yes, it has, a, it has a, a larger number of spaces on one end than the other, but um, I would think that that would be part part of the overall site plan review, but the calculations don't factor that in any way. Okay. In the case of Fresh Farms mm -hmm. and their previous building, would it have benefited us at all to have done maybe a better analysis of what their traffic was at the time? to be able to maybe manipulate those numbers so that we allowed more parking? Would that, would that have done us any good? We do, have some, um, uh, we do have some theory as to, uh, to what, what aspect of that development um, seems to be, in our, in our view, um, causing a higher parking demand. Um, okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. What? And, and there, there's a slide for it later on. But the, um, the, our, and we had the same questions that um, the commission did: is what, what might be causing this? We went and took a look at it, and our, the, the best, the, the, the single most interesting thing that we found about it was that it, it has a higher employee density than a typical retail store. And we have um, some statistics on it later that compare it to other similar retailers. Um, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But yeah, we, we, we believe that it is more attributable to that one factor than any other factor. 
Um, the, the second most important part of that is popularity. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to predict or legislate for the popularity of one store compared to its um, peers. Although I, I think to be fair though, uh, the front, the northern facing parking lot of Fresh Farms has always been full. And the south lot that used to be behind the old bank, whatever, never had anybody. It was like a ghost town. I mean, right. uh, lonely tree in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, neighbors were were parking there. The mm -hmm. you know the oh, yeah, right the yeah. carpet store, tile store, yeah, the yeah, auto, right. whatever place it was. So, so in the case of Fresh Farms, what we're saying here is that if there would have been no reduction it would have been 255 the required some of the uses so if you take the, the grocery store and then all the stores that we know of right now including an allotment for the vacant stores uh, that is uh, 255 and it actually it has 225 okay so then so and the 225 is 25 percent reduction that is the actual number of parking spaces. I haven't gotten to the reduction yet. The actual number of parking spaces at the store, at the shopping center, is 225. Okay. So then the actual ratio per thousand mm -hmm. is the 225, the 3.59 per thousand is 225. Yes. Okay. And then using a spec of 5.5 that's 5.5 times 62 right is that what you're saying there for that's 5.5 with the 62,000 right? right and then the 241 is using a 4.0 okay per thousand oh it's per thousand okay all right Andrew yes and, and I'll just bring it up because it was one of the topics that uh, Norm was concerned about you know the and, and he felt that it was the impact of the bank in the Schwimm crossing and the impact of the bank in uh, uh, the Fresh Farms that might have contributed to the problem. Now, is there any possibility, you know, the bank uh, not necessarily having a lot of uh, employees nor a highly visited entity, but it does have a drive-through, and you have to accommodate maybe with slightly larger aisles and stuff to provide exit routes and stuff that maybe a bank can eat, the physical presence of the bank can eat into uh, the shopping center perception of being congested if it is like in Schwinn and um, in Fresh Farms, kind of in the center, I won't say center, it's in the center of the end of a parking lot. We haven't done enough study to say anything definitive about banks. I, I think it is fair to say that a outlot building eats up potential parking. I mean, anytime you have an outlot building, uh, that is located directly in front of a shopping center, you're right, the, there's a parking, there's an aisle, there's a drive aisle around it that not only can you take the parking spaces of the building footprint, but you've got that multiplied out by trash enclosure, drive-through space, um, four drive-throughs in this case. So yes, it, it certainly the, the trade-off, we don't know the number, but there's a trade-off. It does not typically uh, we, you know, in the planning and economic development world, don't view banks as being particularly heavy parking users, generally. Um, some towns have a, much, have a lower parking requirement for a bank than a retail store. Um, what, what, what you can say for sure, though, is yes. I mean, if, it, if that had been parking and the bank had been in the build, in, in line um, and not had a drive-through and just taken up its 4,000 square feet, <coughs> inside it would have had um you know you definitely would have had more space for for parking uh, but how much of an impact that actually has on now once it's there how much of an impact it has on the parking 
generally speaking, the you know banks as a rule are not open at night. They don't tend to conflict with uh, restaurants for that reason. So they're generally considered to be benign. They don't tend to conflict with the other uh, the other uses. It, is it possible to? Uh I mean, I, I presume the parking requirements for the bank are included in that overall 25% reduction and yes. stuff. Uh, if Norm's theory is correct that just due to the amount of space that the bank facility, not necessarily its parking, but its drive-through and wider aisles, uh, would it be possible to somehow feed into that formula a correction factor if a bank is an outlot? And, and would it be only for banks or if it were some kind of restaurant? I mean, there is, there are, there is another outlot over at the Schwinn's. Does that add I think extra insult, if you would, to... I, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, hypothetically, that if the if the bank is gone, it has no parking requirement, and the space that it took up is parking. Um, I think the really the key thing to remember about the banks um, and their role in these developments is they are they are a solid solid tenant. If you are a developer looking to build a shopping center, a bank can do something that a startup restaurant can't do. They can sign a 30-year guaranteed lease. They can do things that help you as a developer finance the rest of the project. So in the case of the Fifth Third out in front of the Staples, um, uh, if that is not there, there's a chance the entire development isn't there because they cannot finance the project without some, so that they have a guarantee of Staples and they had a guarantee from Right. The third. Oh, fifth. Those two being on. Sure, but but let me just offer a hypothetical situation. I don't know what the numbers are. If you're going to put a bank in the middle of a lot, kind of the way it is today, um, <clears throat> then some portion doesn't get 25 percent reduction. But if you put that bank in the corner of the outlot, you take a look at the Jewel in Buffalo Grove that has an IHOP on an outlot in the corner. I don't think that that outlot impacts anything at all for for that IHOP. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that it doesn't commandeer a lot of space. If it had to have a drive-through and a whole bunch of other no. stuff, it it might start impacting. So, I mean, is, is there any way, you know, placement may I mean, it's a, be effective? It's a site plan question, exactly. not a parking calculation question. I think what you're left with in the end is still X amount of square feet and X number of parking spaces. But, but the site plan, what I, you're getting at, I think, is a site plan question. Is it, but, a, is it a better way to design a site? But how do you, how do you, I mean, you got to motivate these people a little bit too, and you motivate them by giving them a 25% discount. But if you say that's only if you put the outlets in the corners or, or something, as soon as we figure out what the problem is, right, you motivate them by don't giving them that reduction for this, that, and some other. Yeah, I think it would be hard to make a case if the numbers add up to the same amount and the ratio is the same in the end. I think it's hard to make a case that it's had a... You know, it, you know, all things being equal, if you look at the numbers and they've got 10,000 square feet and, you know, uh, 400 parking spaces, it's, it's the, you know, you're still at a, 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 the same ratio of, of spaces. So I, I mean, it's something we can look at to see if anybody else handles it differently. It's not something we've done yet, but we can certainly, certainly look at it. Okay. Thank you. And at Schwind, I mean, last summer, the smallest space was using the most parking there when yogurt land opened up and it was a very small store to but predict popularity. Th i think it still is uh, they, they were you know filling up that lot you couldn't get near staples or Chipotle. and they only have two seats yeah <laughs> um just 
flipping from one slide to the next, we're still on the same question of how, how does actual demand compare with the code ratios. In this next one, uh, we actually do apply the reduction. So you take in this, in where we were looking at the, the 381 <coughs> as being the requirement for uh, Riverside, you apply the reduction. Uh, it starts to close that gap of what was required. I mean, it's a fairly obvious mathematical statement. You reduce the amount of parking, it eats up what the gap was. But the, the point of this is, is the reduction is intended to increase land use efficiency. It's intended to recognize that the larger a shopping center is, the more likely it is to be able to absorb uh, the cycling of the tenants um, and the customers. You've got turnover that is handled better because there are more spaces. Um, you've got a higher likelihood that people have different peak hours. Um, and and that's, that's the purpose of, re of reducing, is to just increase the efficiency of the use of land and bring the supply of parking and the demand for parking closer. Andrew? Yes. I, I hate to belabor this, but if you look at the square footage of Riverside Plaza, which is almost 70,000. Then you look at Fresh Farms, which is, it's different, but not that much different. Then you go to the required sum of uses at 381 for Riverside and 255 at Fresh Farms. That just seems to be such a huge disparity. The disparity is mostly the absence of restaurants at Fresh Farms. But now we're introducing them. So, I mean, there, you know what I'm saying? There hasn't been one introduced yet. <laughs> Pardon me? There hasn't been one introduced yet. Yet. But, I mean, it's... it's <coughs> that, see, I, that's what confuses me when we talk about parking. But whether it's a restaurant or not, it has nothing to do with the stalls provided. Right? I mean, you're still talking about square feet. I, versus right. stalls provided, and, and I, whether I it's guess, a restaurant or a well, but it, and used I'm car looking at square footage still. versus required parking. I maybe I'm looking at it too literally no, I, here. No, but. I, I think you're, I think you're right, Pam, because the required for Riverside Plaza 381 is existing uses, right? It's the sum of all the, the existing uses. Existing uses. So, Terry, that that takes into consideration the restaurants that are at. Um, it's not speculative use, it's actual usage. So, as Andrew said, there's more restaurants in Riverside. But that, we didn't but, always know but, that there was going to be restaurants in no, Riverside. No, but, but Pam so is I'm talking about is, stalls provided, which are on the lot right now, doesn't have anything to do with... Oh, okay, got it. Got it. Right? Yep. Do as, you, do you as Riverside, okay. yeah. as Riverside Am started... Am I looking at this the wrong way? No, I think, I think what just for some historical perspective on it, as Riverside started to increase the share of restaurant space, it, it had a few things that came through. It had a overall reduction by variation. The code didn't yet provide for this. Riverside came in in the 80s uh, and applied for a separate parking ratio just for that shopping center. They said, just across the board, everything in here is going to is going to be, I can't remember the numbers, 3.2. They, they assigned a low number. The code said four. Let's use 3.2. It was an attempt to make the numbers work out because they were starting to see restaurants interested in the space. When they got the restaurants, those restaurants then had individual variations on top of the blanket uh, variation for the shopping center. So. As they, as each one of those came in, they presented a case on special use standards and a case on parking variation standards that said, yes, we are this short on parking if you add up everything. However, <clears throat> there's parking available, it works, please let us move in. Okay, that, but, but then to be fair, right, if Riverside were to have had, a, I'll just call it in the olden days, we used to come up with a required parking and then we had a, a delta for special uses to grow into. Mm -hmm. what, 
what would Riverside's parking have been required before any variations or special deals were made? Would it have been double what uh, the allocation to fresh farms would have been? I would imagine it was probably this somewhere in the neighborhood of this number. I don't, I don't have it, but I would imagine when it got built, it probably used something near the 4.0 number, which would not have given it a surplus. I mean, the, the delta, the surplus, it would not have given it a, a bank of 30 spaces to then share among the special uses in the future. Just looking at the table, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been enough. So. My, my guess is it probably came in with something in the 4.0 range and then um, maybe there was an addition done to the building. And at the time of the addition, it had already shown, that, you know, the center had already shown a pattern of not using all of its parking, so the addition was probably allowed. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to say without actually going back through the, the, um, the, the plans and the approvals on it. But I mean, in terms of Pam's question, though, the the actual number that was provided was based upon some kind of development agreement, or it wasn't our code required number. But what I guess you're right. What that that is my question. But how is it that that we don't see the same problem? Maybe it's because of usage. We don't see the same problem at Riverside that we're seeing at Fresh Farms. I'm trying to figure out how, how we adjust these numbers to fit the square footage so we don't get into this pickle again. Right. I mean, I, I realize that Fresh Farms usage is greater. I understand that. And, but now we're going to have two more conceivable people entering so we're going to be even tighter. In the future, how, how do we adjust this? Do we, do we increase these numbers across the board? And, and if somebody has too much parking, so be it. And somebody like Fresh Farms, we could have adjusted our figures or adjusted our percentages so that we would have allocated for the, I mean, how do we do this? I think, that's, I think what you're asking is kind of the next step of this is, you know, having analyzed some of this, what what are the what are the types of changes that could be made? Um, you know, completing the analysis, do we need to make changes to the way that we handle the the parking for shopping centers, or is it a use specific? Do we have a do we have the development of a new land use? Um, and, and as we wrap this part of it up, I, I think that th those are the types of questions that we're, we're setting for this, for this next, uh, the next steps of this is what, having analyzed this and trying to put a, put a uh, explanation on why things have turned out at the various shopping centers, not just fresh farms, you know, why, why did Lexington turn out the way that it, that it did? Why did Arlington Club Commons turn out the way that it did? Um, you know, what's working, what's not working? Is it, are there commonalities? Um, maybe. Is there, is there something uh, that's an anomaly with the fresh farm situation that, that is so unusual that it doesn't need to be adjusted for on a future shopping center? I think that's kind of what, these are the questions that I think we're coming up with. I mean, is it because of the specific anchor that we have there that caused this Maybe this is an isolated case. Maybe it's never going to happen again. But we can't assume that. I was, I was, but based on whatever the anchor would be into any center, we need to be able to have that flexibility of adjusting the parking in order yeah. to accommodate so we don't go through this again. I think, um, I think the next handful, we actually have a couple of these types of questions are, are incorporated in the next handful of slides. And if, if I don't cover it, um, if it's not close enough to what you're talking about, let me know and we'll, we'll keep going with it. Um, so, this, uh, we did that one. Um, so the, the question of the this, this speculative requirement. This, as you know, the, the speculative requirement has only been around a few years. Uh, we based it on 
um, an analysis of all the shopping centers when we instituted it uh, to try to come up with an idea of had this shopping center been assigned a spec requirement at the very beginning when it was first, first um, built, would it have had enough surplus at the site to be able to handle flexibility of use later on? Would, would there be enough parking if a new restaurant tenant came in? So it's, it sounds worse than it is. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's just basically, if you take the sum of the current uses, you add it all up, and compare that to what five and a half per thousand would have been, um, was it a good guess? That, that's all this is. And generally speaking, yes, yes it is. It's a good guess. It's a good, it's a good addition to the code uh, to use the spec requirement. Um, again, it is easier to upset the balance of parking in a, in a smaller shopping center. It only takes one restaurant with 40 seats to have a proportional impact on a shopping center that only has 50 parking spaces to begin with. Um, but if you, if you take a look at this, there are some that are uh, higher, lower. Fresh Farms, I will talk about on this slide when we get to it in a second, but Fresh Farms, a little bit unusual here uh, because of the size of the anchor tenant that did not use the spec requirement. Um, Riverside, if you look back at it, very close. The spec requirement would have been a very good predictor for Riverside. Uh, Lexington Commons would have been uh, off <laughs> uh, by, by, uh, by some amount. Uh, they would have been 30% uh, under. Lexington Commons Plaza has um, restaurants. It has a high, uh, <coughs> high demand outbuilding. Um, so in that case, it would not have been uh, a, a good predictor. Uh, Schwinn Crossing is not a particularly good predictor. We, we ended up with more seats uh, total across, across all the units. Uh, and that, that's why that one is not a good predict predictor. Fresh Farms, had it had the spec requirement, would have been extremely high. Remember, the spec requirement was on the books at this time. It was not the, rest, the, excuse me, the grocery store itself was a known quantity and didn't use the spec requirement and is um, over 50% of that shopping center. So not, it's not a surprise that since we didn't use the spec requirement that it ended up not being a good predictor. Uh, Arlington Club Commons, Lynn Plaza, these, were, these are the types of uh, places we were looking at when we came up with that number, so it's, um, it, they should match up pretty well with it. So I, I think the, the question that we have that's kind of ongoing, it's gonna take uh, some additional work is, is the reduction a good number. Is 15% starting at 20,000? Correct. Is it too much of a reduction too soon? Um, we don't really know this exactly. You'd, ha you'd have to do a little bit more study of actual parking usage. Without that, you're just basing, basing it on perception of usage. And I think that our staff would feel much more comfortable getting actual numbers of usage before, uh, before making any sort of recommendation on this. Um, but you don't know what's going to move into that shopping center. But it's true, you don't know what's <laughs> going to move into the shopping center, but you, you know what's there. And most of these are fully leased, um, and they probably represent a pretty typical tenant mix for that size shopping center, for the size units available. And you could take a look at it and say, um, you know, if you apply the 15% reduction, is it, is it too much? You know, should, should we be looking at a smaller reduction. Should the threshold for that reduction start at a higher square footage? You know, did we, did we overdo it uh, with this reduction or did we, did we get it right? Um, the you know, but I, I think you, you bring up a, a, a very valid concern because if you look back to uh, Lynn Plaza when it first started out, what was in there? A Jewel Food Store, a National Dominic's, Dominic's. It was some, a Dominic's, right. And then and there was Walgreens. a Walgreens next right. door, and then there was a Douglas Hardware store in there as the well. Walgreens or Mark Trucks? No, it's yeah, Walgreens. Walgreens. Well, Mark. both are the same. And then? <laughs> you know, the and, and if you look back then, that lot was pretty full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Excuse me, a lot, a lot, a lot fuller full. than it is today. Right. You know, and we've added 
an outlet to that center we as did. well. Right. And uh, you know the the parking. I don't think today is a problem over at uh, no. Fresh Farms. But had we put that outlet in back when it was a Jewel and a Walgreens and a Fresh Farms, that would have uh, hurt the center. So I, I guess my my concern is we we've got. An existing space and you know whatever that space is and if you set the parking too low then you're potentially infringing on a business being very successful and you know drawing a lot more customers than it has maybe something to the effect like uh, fresh farms is experiencing you know on the other hand if you build too much <coughs> parking it's going to be like the Kmart property was, right? Just a, mm -hmm. That's a big place that you have to plow and you get no benefit from. So, I mean, where, where do you draw the trade-off? You have to say, if you take a look at Lynn Plaza and Arlington Commons today, you know, they're, they're okay successful, they're, they're surviving, but could they be a lot more successful? And would they need a lot more parking? And, where do we need to draw the line at just saying uh, it's okay or giving them a little bit more room to grow and if they grow obviously we get more sales tax revenue and all, all that kind of stuff. Right, and But it, maybe it is a, harder to attract a business because they don't want to provide all that part. I think, I think you're identifying the, the, same, the same issue which is you know, you want to have a pretty good, you want to have a pretty good predictor. Your code should predict what is likely to happen. Overdoing it one way is not good. Overdoing it the other way also not good. So you want to you want to try to get a, a good balance. You want it to be balanced. And I think that's the same question that we're we're coming to on this. Um, and this, like I said, this this particular slide without having additional study, you're using the same number and going back into the same calculation, so it's not really meaningful. Um, I think you could say, though, that it is our, our number, uh, the absolute minimum number that we just, that we just added. Um, I think we set that at a conservative and low, uh, a low ratio. I mean, we, we knew what these ratios were when we, when we set that low ratio. Um, the oh, absolute one minimum probably could be raised without having much of an impact um, and without needing any, you know, you, I don't think you'd need to do any significant amount of study to do that. Um, so if there was a, a desire to do that, I think that's something we could do. The rest of it, I think you'd probably need, you know, this 20,000. Well, um, let me just run through some. There's a couple of other towns that we took a look at, and I think it could be, um, could be useful to kind of see what, how our shopping centers handled. Uh, Northbrook um, has a higher threshold for starting its flat ratio. So they they at, they start theirs at um, at 100,000 square feet. Um, they go down to four per thousand um, instead of just the sum of the units. So they stop calculating each individual unit at that point. Um, the the exception to that is the high intensity uses. If a shopping center ends up attracting, uh, by its location or design, a, a concentration of high high intensity uses, so uh, a few restaurants, a health club, that sort of thing, if those uses end up see, exceeding 10 percent of the square footage of the uh, shopping center, they have their own parking requirement that kicks in at that point. So you can have a cup, you know, you could have a, a small sandwich shop. You could have uh, a sm an ice cream place in a shopping center of that size, and it would still get counted in with the retail. But there's a point, and they, they've determined that to be 10%. There's a point at which you have enough of it that it needs to be counted differently. And that number, that 15 per thousand number, is actually pretty similar to what our number works out to be, our seat-based number. Uh, Buffalo Grove. Um, pretty simple requirements. They just leave everything <laughs> pretty much. They go four and a half for everything. 
Um, I, I did not have time to talk to their planner about this, but they have this major tenant provision. So a major tenant that requires more parking. So if the biggest tenant in the shopping center is a health club and requires more parking, it would still have its own requirement plus all the, excuse me, all the uh, other smaller stores would have this four and a half. Um, and they do have a dining requirement of 10 per thousand. Uh, Glenview has a low requirement for uh, retail and office. Dining is similar to ours. They, um, they have a very low downtown dining requirement, encouraging restaurants um, in their uh, traditional downtown. Um, and they're one of the towns that offers reductions based on proximity to public parking. Um, Arlington Heights um, has an extremely low uh, downtown requirement. Their parking, their parking requirement is much more um, what you might expect in a more urbanized area. Um, again, access to transit, access to public parking. Uh, a and they just don't have the room. Availability of street parking, uh, that sort of thing. So the dining, dining in Arlington Heights is 22. Yes, it's a big number. Man, that, that's huge. outside of the downtown. That's huge. Once you hit the downtown, everything drops. But outside of the downtown, they have a very high uh, parking requirement for dining. Wow. That's, that's a lot. Andrew, any, any speculation about uh, the Weston? I mean, we're, we are still, I think, a restaurant, a large restaurant short on the approved plan for the Weston property, and we know that it's when uh, Claim Jumpers was operating at full capacity, it was a problem. So, as, what, as, as what, that, what as did we do right lots, and wrong there? Well, I think that's a topic for another day. I think you've got a a extremely unusual anchor tenant, if you will. I mean, it's a PUD that's centered around a hotel, and hotels are an entirely different animal than any of these other things. Um, I think it's probably best to save it for another day. Okay. <laughs> and then there's a lot so, of other so things there. So much depends on what is going on there. Um, just <laughs> just a couple other quick thoughts before we break for residential. Um, Mount Prospect, nothing really out of the ordinary, nothing really worth highlighting there. Uh, just to wrap up commercial, uh, again, these are regulations based on broad data uh, that's collected across an industry. They do not factor in popularity. Um, the, what I think we've seen in Wheeling is, is the lack of off-street, um, excuse me, the lack of street parking and public parking does magnify an issue, whereas if you had some of the same um, anomalies, if you had something similar to what we've experienced at Fresh Farms in a place that does have public parking readily available, it would be absorbed into the public parking more so, and you might not see it have that much of an impact. Um, and then the, the point um, to Commissioner Dorban, what, what is it that we think is unusual? This is it, uh, employee density. Uh, we took a look at competitors, and, and Fresh Farms, by the way, would not consider Jewel and Dominic's to be its direct competition necessarily, so I don't mean to offend them if they're <laughs> watching this. Uh, but grocery stores are counted the same in our code across the board. doesn't matter if it's a Jewel, a Dominic's, or a Fresh Farms. Jewel has an employee density of one employee for every 1,400 square feet. Dominic's has an employee for every 2,100 square feet. And Fresh Farms has an employee for every 565 square feet. It is uh, four times more employees per square foot um, than the grocery stores that are nearby. That's not something that our code accounts for in any way. It's not something that our code requires to be documented. It is what we have learned to try to figure out what is different about that shopping center, what, what was not part of the original calculation. If, what would you have guessed, rule of thumb, uh, a, a typical Fresh Farms size store would have needed in terms of Headcount employees. If I had to guess, but just not for knowing anything about it, <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, prob I probably would have guessed somewhere between ten and twenty. 
And how many do they have today? Uh, they have 55. They have some shifts that have more, but they have 55 on a typical shift. Wow. Okay, so I mean, it is double, at least double, what your rule of thumb would have. Well, we didn't really have a rule of thumb. We don't. It's not something we track. I mean, if you had asked me to guess that, I would have guessed that. But we don't have a. But that's got to be built into the code, right? right then. It's yes. part of the four per thousand. Right. So, but. But on many occasions, if I'm, if I'm not, on many occasions when somebody comes before us, like a dental office or, mm -hmm. or something, I thought you always said, well, they need X amount of parking plus the assumption of however many employees. That's correct. You don't do that for grocery stores? Not for retail stores. The retail store, there's, there has not, to this point, been a, there's nothing in our code that looks at how many employees a retail store has. We have it for many different other types of stores, offices, et cetera. We have, we have some types of offices, medical, dental, so, where we count, we count employees. Or if it might have been a special use, you might ask that question. Restaurants factor in employees. Okay, so why, so could you do some analysis to see what it would take to add that factor into our parking requirements? But I, I don't think you can. Why not? Because in any retail store that comes in and you say, how many employees do you have? Well, I've got five employees. Well, next year I sell that store. I sell it to some other retailer who has 20 employees. They don't need a special use. They just come in and start doing business. The only thing well, they need is a sign. But that's true. We could take we can take a look at it. I think part of part of the question is, um, you know, may, maybe there's a way to handle it that is back to the special use. You know, you can a a a store a retail store of a certain size uh, requires a special use, and maybe that is something that you just add to the use table. You add it to the application <coughs> once once a retail store is large enough that it requires a special use. It has an asterisk in the parking table that says retail store greater than 15. I think we have, yeah. yeah I think you, you probably could do it in some fashion attached to a special use. You go to, if you look at the, the way the um, parking table is broken down, there you can easily add a spot. I, I think you could pretty easily add a spot that says, you know, retail store greater than 15, 20,000 square feet and just have it, there's a general reference in that table that says to be determined during review. I, go ahead. I think when Yogurtland came in, they came in with two seats and one employee or something like that, and, and the official requirement was two car slots, right? No, no requirements. But I think we changed that after the fact. Didn't we set, setting some kind of minimum, no matter how many seats or employees you have? Yes, we did change that. Um, and um, yeah, there was a there's a minimum. It was it was the the bonus, the outdoor seating freebies that you know we were relating it back to. You could not have more um, outdoor seats than indoor seats, and take advantage of the free oh. parking. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I think it's something we can look at. Um, we'll take a look. I think you could probably do something. There, be, there could be a trade-off where you take the the four per thousand and and drop it because it's such a large store. But then also then add back uh, some factor, whether it's one to one for the employees or something similar to one to one for the employees. I think you could come up with a number that's fair and does prevent um, a a changeover of a really large store from going without any kind of review. Um, the, uh, I've, I've talked about most of this. Um, the, the point though, uh, the Commissioner Stiles made, you know, the, the reason you want to find this balance is that it's, you know, some retailers need a certain amount of parking and won't locate without it. Um, but the other side of that is the cost. Um, we just did some, some calculations on surface parking and um, we, Using a land value and a, and a real current construction value, we'd estimate that 
it's almost six thousand dollars per stall to construct surface parking and wheeling, plus the trade-off in reducing <coughs> building size. So the, the project overall to the developer, if the parking is required, is six thousand dollars plus the loss of building. So it is it is potentially depending on the size of the development and the amount of parking that's off one way or the other, it's potentially a, a, a fact a significant factor when building a new uh, shopping center. Does land banking work in a case like this? Land banking would take out the construction aspect of it, but not the trade-off of building <coughs> versus not building, because you still have to reserve the land. Interesting. That isn't a bad idea, though. Well, it, it's not a bad idea, but if it's not, <coughs> if it's not logical and it doesn't work. I, I don't know. I, that was my only, I mean, we do it with a lot of other things. Well, I mean, the nice thing about land banking, though, is that they don't have to immediately put in the Sick parking. The cost in. And, and if they are successful, they have some room to automatically grow into, you know, and I think that that would be a nice feature to, Could be. to at least be able to consider. Could be. It cuts back on the cost factor, but and it cuts back on them initial the initial expense. Right. And if they like you said, if they become very successful, then you know put it in later. But I, I don't know how else to to alleviate a problem. You know where we in our mind we believe that this partic <coughs> particular business is going to be successful and going to need it, but we don't want them to have to. Put up the expense up front. I, I think what what I would take away from from this is, um, and, and you know, like I said, we're gonna go, we'll be happy to do some additional study of this. I think that what I would take away from this, um, and what I would suggest the commission consider is, um, you know, have, having seen something unusual happen, um, really try to get to the root of what it is that caused it. Um, you know, what, what is it that is unusual that we didn't anticipate previously? And um, are there ways that we can adjust the requirements? Um, you know, first of all, take a look at the likelihood. I mean, is, is it something that's likely to happen again? If it, if it is, absolutely, you know, let's figure it out. If it's something that seems just so unusual, uh, in this case, I don't know that it is that unusual. I think we've we talked to um, uh, I talked to the planner for Hoffman Estates, and uh, she was concerned that uh, a similar grocery store there might end up having a similar impact. So, a grocery store that operates with a higher number of employees because it has more fresh produce, more fresh fish, more fresh meat, it is different, perhaps. So, well, but Fresh Farms, I think that right away we realize they're what four times as many employees. Right. Yeah. Well, they're in, it, they're in itself. But did they know, did they know that up front, you that's, think? That's what I, I we don't know. Could I, they I don't have think we have any. Uh, they that. may have been able to, but it's not, it's going back to three years ago, there's, there's no indication and no precedent for even factoring, asking. for even asking. They, they wouldn't have volunteered it. We wouldn't have asked it. It's, it wasn't something that had caused a problem. Um, again, that's assuming that it is the problem. We, we think that that is most likely what caused the, uh, the, the, the discrepancy between amount of parking and, and um, amount of parking actually available and the number of spaces. So, um, but I, I think if, that, if we're fairly confident that that is something that is um, likely to happen again. I think it probably does have a solution. I think the combination of special use and uh, I think there is probably a way to to adjust. Um, it, and you're never ever going to be able to adjust for a very successful establishment, right? I mean, you look at Bob Chin's. I remember when Bob Chin came in and he had more than enough parking for his hundred seats, right? And then all of a sudden. He, he needed to squeeze in a few more tables and chairs, and then before you know it, 
He was parking in the neighborhoods, everything, neighbors were complaining. And at that time, he couldn't expand. There was no cross-axis agreements, whatever. Right. I, I think, you know, probably even on, on a simpler example would be the RAM. I think it's it has Another it has example. more more cars per seat. The demand is, is more cars per seat than what our code uh, requires. There are plenty of restaurants that our code is more than what they uh, what they need. Do do they we just, still have that uh, easement or whatever across their parking lot for a future street? Can they park in that? Uh, are you referring to the south or to the the north side? They have yes, they're able to park up there. Okay, and they have the the public parking that's adjacent to their um, uh, restaurant. But yeah, it's you know it's every now and then place is successful and not a bad thing <laughs> no as long as you don't uh, you know infringe upon the neighbors or uh, other businesses that get hurt because they're successful you know, I think we should strive to be to try to make everybody equally successful right Andrew if uh, let's say Chase or fifth third said you know, this, this parking's a problem for us. We're going to put up bank parking only signs <clears throat> for the spaces that we're required to have. Mm -hmm. That's going to throw off your reductions, correct? I mean, would they have to come to us to do something like that? Just off the top of my head, no, I don't think they would have to. I guess it depends on, you know, it depends on the shopping center. Some shopping centers have an agreement with the village for us to enforce parking violations within the shopping center parking. Um, wouldn't he have to go, wouldn't those banks have to go to the... To the, the landlord. Landlord. Yeah, the landlord. The landlord would have to agree to it. Uh, okay. probably, they'd probably say, I mean, if it was a significant number of spaces, they might say no to that. Or if Liquor Barn did it, you know, any anybody. Take a minute and then come back for residential? Yes. Let's take a couple minutes. Five minutes.
Back in. Hold on. Sure. <coughs> We're back. That's okay. And what I'm going to be presenting tonight is regarding the residential component of parking, uh, namely multifamily parking. Uh, just to give you a little background information, um, our code was until 2005 based on the number of uh, bedrooms in each unit. And right now it's a straight number 2.75 parking spaces is required per unit, regardless of the number of bedrooms. <clears throat> also in 2005 in our code we required covered parking at a ratio of one covered space per unit. So th those were uh, two key changes. Um, however no apartment or condo condos have been constructed um, since this code change. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've had um, um, a few, we've had the, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Take your time. Um, the only multifamily um, residential parking, uh, residential project that's been constructed since 2005 is Millbrook Point, but that's townhomes. Um, and this is important that we look at this um, code is because our current code discourages unit types in higher demand today, which is one or two bedrooms. Uh, Brooke, so how does it discourage that? That's because there's, um, regardless of the number of bedrooms in a unit, you're still required to provide 2.75 parking spaces. I see, thanks. And so here we've provided the data for parking requirements in um, several of our neighboring communities. And <clears throat> you can see that Wheeling requires 2.75, which is almost as high as uh, the highest um, community in, in this um, chart, which is Northbrook. Um, our neighboring community, Buffalo Grove, requires only 1.7. Spaces per unit, regardless of uh, bedrooms, number of bedrooms. Um, also, not shown in the chart, but worth noting is that uh, the Wheeling, Northbrook, and Mount Prospect also require guest parking. Do those then, other, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do those other towns require covered parking? No, no other town requires covered parking. So we are alone in that. Um, so what we did is took a sample, a hypothetical development of 100 um, residential units um, at a ratio of 25 one bedroom, 52 bedroom, and 25 three bedrooms. And we looked at the parking requirements for that, um, that building in each of the six towns shown. And so what would be required in Wheeling is 275 uh, parking stalls, of which 100 would be covered, and of which 275, 28 would be unassigned for guest parking. Um, Northbrook also requires guest parking, and so does Mount Prospect, but the other communities do not. Um, <clears throat> and um, so as you can see, um, we, we require quite, quite a bit higher um, standard of parking co in comparison to many of the other neighboring communities. Um, so so up, um, the 28 unassigned guest parking, yes. that's part of the 275? That's right. So really our ratio, <clears throat> okay, so if we took that out, our ratio would be like 2.5. 2.5. Which is still higher than, than Buffalo Grove, but I still can, well, okay, continue on. I, I think the unassigned parking is something that's really needed that, that should be taken into consideration as we do this. 
So, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So what we did is took that hypothetical situation of that 100 units and actually determined the cost of parking um, for structured parking, for co covered parking, which is structured, or for carports, since our code allows for both types of um, covered parking. Um, and so um, a, what we found out was that if we were to require structured parking, it would cost the development $2.25 million more than if it was just street or um, unstructured parking or uncovered parking. So a 100 unit apartment building, which you had before, would cost $2.25 million more to be built in Wheeling just because of the covered parking? That's correct. If they did a structured parking garage, you're talking about. We took it. We considered an average range of something in either underground parking or structured. We kind of took an average of those different costs. Right. That, that's not just because you got carports. Yeah, that's a completely yeah. different figure. Ooh. And so, um, what we want to point out is that. For what the market is demanding right now is um, rental apartments, and there's not much demand, according to the developers that are interested in developing. You know, current, current, like the Kinsey project, they came and and were proposing a figure much lower than the 1.1 per one um, unit, one covered uh, space per unit. They're suggesting that. Um, the demand is only for 25% of uh, structured parking um, for rental units. So we're just we're requiring developers to construct much more parking than they can pay for because they, if for rental units, they're not going to be able to rent those structured um, covered un uh, parking spaces, and so. And so we did some calculations, and even if um, the, the covered parking spaces were fully rented 12 months of the year, <coughs> that would cost that would cost the developer the 2.25 million dollars, and that would take 10 years to be paid off. So um, we also considered the carports, and we thought if. Um, they, uh, they rented the carports at only $30 a month. That would only be paid off then in 22 years. So that's, it's not really feasible that we would, I mean, make the developer construct the carports and he would have to wait, he or she would have to wait 22 years for that to be paid off in order to make the money back on the cost of renting those carport spaces. How did the covered parking requirement come into play in the first place? What, what triggered that? The um, covered parking requirement um, came, came about in the 2005 overhaul of the zoning code. Uh, it was when the um, the bedroom based requirement was replaced with a straight 2.75 uh, covered parking was incorporated into that. You know, I think at the time it was it was probably anticipated that anything that was um, not going to meet that requirement would come in as a PUD, and that uh, they would have some sort of variation associated with it. I, I don't know that. Uh, the village projected out a drop in the condo market, uh, projected out a, a drop in the housing market overall. So I, I think it's just a matter of this is, this is where things are heading. As each new building comes in front of the plan commission and the board, the trend at the time was toward covered parking. And I think it made sense to continue that standard and reflect it in the code. Um, and it, I think that's 
Yeah, you know, the commissioners who are here at the time might be able to to uh, add to that. But I, I believe that that is, that is really where it started. It was a continuation of, of a trend that was seen here. I was here and I don't, I don't I, remember. I don't know. I was here and I think I remember. You okay. probably don't want to hear it, but I think <laughs> I remember. Uh, I think the scenario went something to the effect of uh, what kind of apartment building, whatever do you want? Do you want <clears throat> low level, medium level, or high level? What kind of, what kind of, what level of income people do you want accessing the facility? And if you, if you provide a, a high price apartment with high priced accoutrements that you will probably draw people that make a higher amount of money than if you just had outdoor parking and no accoutrements at all and very small rooms and whatever that you will draw a different income oriented level person and I think I remember if, it the same way you if, if I remember correctly the goal was to try to raise the bar raise the bar and uh, seek a higher income level people so that we could bring them to our higher price stores get more income for the village etc 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 I think I mean you may not want to hear it but I think that's oh, that, 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 that being what said, I suspected that being said I think you still have a situation where the uh, the projection from the comprehensive plan at that time, um, you know, we had just come through the overhaul of the comp plan as well before that preceded the, uh, the zoning code update. The comprehensive plan identifies gaps in the housing market. What, what types of housing are not being provided? I think the, uh, to take a, a, a uh, an approach of, well, what is what is the the housing that is lacking if you look at the spectrum of housing provided um if that is what is lacking you certainly might have 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 had um uh a greater impact it probably would have had a greater impact at that time i think if somebody had had a uh had been able to look ahead and say well it seems likely that um, that demographic three years from now is going to end up renting and not buying. I don't think anybody would have believed them if somebody said the same demographic that you're trying to attract by providing this condo will only look at rental housing, you know, five, six, seven years from now. Uh, you, you can't predict everything. I think that um, looking back at it now, I think that we've got a, a situation where um, the particular housing type that is in demand in that same demographic is now discouraged by the exact same thing that you were trying to encourage before. And I think that's kind of the, the point of what we're getting at. It, it'd be interesting to uh, have Mr. Smith come in. I think he's probably the only active developer or even uh, Who's the other guy right across the street uh, in uh, Millbrook? Millbrook, yeah. Have them come in and talk about some of these issues because I'm sure they're dealing with that uh, those concepts right now, and they could tell us how beneficial or destructive uh, it is to what they're trying to do. Okay. We have one other slide that shows the cost comparison. Um, developing that same 100 unit building in Wheeling and Buffalo Grove and Buffalo Grove had the much lower parking requirement at one, only 1.7 um, unstructured parking spaces per unit and in Buffalo Grove it would only cost $850,000 for the entire development for their parking in Wheeling that same exact apartment building would cost 3.125 million dollars if it was structured parking and a carport, 1.6 million. You can see it's two to four times as expensive <coughs> to
to develop the same apartment building in Wheeling as it would in our neighboring community. That 8,500, is that still at the $6,000 per parking spot calculation? I believe, yes, <laughs> it is. So, so um, some things we might want to consider in the future, knowing this and, and, and thinking about these costs and the demand, um, <clears throat> we might want to lower the parking requirements in Wheeling, um, and, and maybe perhaps go back to the a unit-based requirement. In the middle column, you'll see um, a unit-based requirement of 1.5 um, spaces per uh, one-bedroom dwelling unit and two per dwelling unit for uh, two bedrooms and greater. Pam, Pam, what was your parking requirement for Brookvale? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know. Do you have enough parking? Yes. But I, I can <coughs> tell you, based on our, our complex, I, I wouldn't want to see us go any lower than what we have, what we have currently, because I, I can see just what it could be. And then we don't have, we have, you know, two car garages, plus two on an apron, plus we have guest parking. And anything, you know, over that, and I've seen guest parking that's taken up. You know, so, and I, you know, you have to accommodate, and we don't always do it, we have to accommodate for snow. snow. You know, um, and that snow can be an issue. You know, knock on wood, we've been lucky the last couple of years, but that's not always the case. <clears throat> You know, three and, years ago, it was a real issue. And I think, too, it depends upon the demographics that uh, the complex is trying to attract, right? If uh, I know a number of the uh, uh, buildings in Buffalo Grove were for more senior-oriented uh, housing and stuff, you know, I, I think that kind of demographic, if you're looking at a, a family uh, situation, even if you have two bedrooms, right? Uh, Square footage has, you know, enters into it. Do they have basements? That enters into it because now you're, you know, you're conceivably having bigger families in in townhouses. Yes. If you have and, and one that has no basement, you may not have, you know, uh, you may not need that. Well, this is just something we initially came up with, staff came up with, um, and I, the third column is uh, considering an even greater parking reduction for the MXT district, um, considering that maybe some households would have less, maybe only one car in a, in a two-couple situation because they would use the train um, for getting to and from work, situations like that. Um, this We considered this, but then we wanted to look at some other data, and um, we looked at the, uh, the the population projections that are used for our um, for um, for our impact fees. Thank you. And uh, this is the data exactly that's used in determining impact fees for multifamily homes based on and it 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 makes some assumptions on who will be living in these units. And so we looked at um, we considered. Um, high school students, because they may be driving, and adults. And if you would consider that each high school student and each adult in that unit would be have a car, one car, um, we calculated that out based on our current um, code, which is 2.75, and um, we did a comparison. And for one bedrooms, there would only be... Um, so this, this um, impact fee calculation is, is assuming there'd be approximately 1.75 um, adults in each one-bedroom ho household. Um, in two-bedroom um, units, we'd have 1.9 adults, and in three or greater bedrooms units, we'd have a, a little over three, um, three adults. Um, <clears throat> What that calculates out to is that um, in our smaller units, it's assuming that based on our current code of 2.75 spaces per a unit, for the smaller units, 
it's assuming that each adult and high school student would have over one and a half cars. And, and that's not really a, a real situation. Um, and even in, in the larger units where they have three or more bedrooms, it's a, it would then assume that each high school student and adult in each unit would have over one car <coughs> per person. And so it's, it seems that based on this data and these population projections, which we use for our impact fees, um, that we are requiring more parking spaces than are really would, would be used in, in new multifamily um, developments. And um, so this requirement um, in, in, a, in our, going back to our um, hypothetical 100 unit building, based on these calculations, it would only require um, parking for 197 cars. Um, and that is um, even less than, than the previous um, calculations that staff came up with, oops, this way, um, that we were suggesting 208 um, based on one uh, parking reduction <coughs> to 1.5 spaces per one bedrooms and two spaces per um, two bedrooms and greater. If you could just stay in this for a second. Sure. The only, the issue I have here is the MXT. <clears throat> we're, we're the suburbs. We're not <coughs> the city. And, and, and I think the demand for cars is much greater. I, I would be reluctant to do something like this because weekend use of cars is... The train's yeah, not running. Yeah, the train's not running, and even even in Arlington Heights or Mount Prospect, that have <coughs> that have you know MXT districts, you know downtown Arlington Heights. I'd like to see if they do a reduction like this, um, because on the weekends, I've got to believe the demand to use the car in the suburbs is much greater than it is in the city. I think I think one of the things that uh, well just a couple of points that I was um, before I answer that the uh, you know the distinction that the staff is making here I think is multifamily um, in a single building we're not talking about the townhomes I think we can uh, if if there is a consensus over the next couple of months to take a look at this again um, I think we we don't have any reason to believe that the townhome requirement should be changed. Um, I, I think that the parking pad requirement and the garage space requirement and the guest parking, uh, we haven't we haven't heard any reason to to modify those um, to this point. Uh, we are talking specifically about the uh, the multifamily um, apartment building style building. Uh, but but Andrew, I think the the thing that is changing is that the people that used to go to the condo style. Now, for whatever reason, banking regulations and inability to get mortgages, whatever, are now going towards the apartment <clears throat> style living, but still going to have that same parking demand, in, in my belief. Well, yeah, the other think, thing is, even if somebody takes the train, they <coughs> still have, a, usually, they have a vehicle to get them to the train. They park the train, but on the weekends, they need a vehicle. So. Conceivably, it's still if it in two bedrooms, it's still two cars. I mean, and this, we that, get to that three. number up there. I mean, what we're looking at up there. Okay, if you take out the MXT for a second, but if you look at the unit based, uh, right. right now we're we are just just if we broke it down by one bedroom, two bedroom, and then greater, uh, you know, sorry, efficiency one bedroom have one requirement, then two. You start. You start taking the likelihood of a higher number of cars per unit and assigning that to the size of the unit. If you start breaking it down that way, you, you get to a point where you're, you aren't so far away from a, a realistic scenario. So I, I don't know if you can you flip back to that one for a second? Yeah. Andrew, though, the problem with that concept is if, if a small 
uh, one bedroom apartment requires 1.1 parking spaces, that means two people are still going to be driving that 1.1 space, right? Whether it be 1.1, 1.4, 1.8, it's still going to be two cars are required. Right, I, I think plus plus some kind of visitor. I, th I think what we're what we're looking at here is not dropping any. I, I, we we were in these hypothetical calculations. We're taking a building. It's the same. We're trying to keep it con consistent throughout. So it's the same 100 unit building. So we're going 100 unit building in the you know taking a look at the standard parking requirement versus the other municipalities. And then when we go into this, it's the same building. If you take that building and use the, the numbers uh, that this is based on, the population projection number is uh, it's a average based on the suburban Chicago area. It's not a, this is not a national, this is not downtown, this is the likelihood of over the entire area when you have this housing type attached, this is a, a multifamily building where they're attached in one building what you get is, on average, 1.29 adults in an efficiency unit, 1.75 adults in a one bedroom. So it does go up as the number of bedrooms go up. And what, what, what we're suggesting is you also increase the parking requirement as you increase the likelihood of adults. We even factored into it 13 year olds driving for this purpose. So. 13-year-olds cannot drive, but we assume that they have their own car in this. So we're taking that number and then trying to make sure that it's still pretty conservative by saying every adult from 13 up, if they all had a car, what would that be? And that's what that number is on the right. So cars per high schooler plus adult means right now what our code says is take the population projection Divide it out. What we're saying is in an efficiency unit, you need 2.13 cars per person who is 13 or older. Even if you go down to the three bedroom where you have the highest likelihood of multiple drivers, cars, we're still requiring more than one, we're, we're still assuming that there's more than one car per person in the unit of that size. So. I think that what, what we're trying to illustrate is the current code requirement is, is sufficient for sure. I don't think there's any debate at all that 2.75 per unit is enough, but it's so far beyond the likelihood of number of cars per unit that you could adjust it down some and still be totally safe in, in providing plenty of parking. It's, it's that large of a jump that you could bring it down and you'd still be to a suburban standard. I and mean, we were still talking about two cars per unit, almost two cars per unit when you take the same building in the MXT even. It's, it's still, it still assumes a lot of driving for sure. Okay. Interesting. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Sure. Brooke, can you please go back to a, a graph that shows uh, the other towns in it? There's Wheeling to Buffalo Grove and Northbrook. <coughs> uh, Brooke and or Andrew, in your discussions with planners in these towns, do they say, man, we have way too many parking, we're requiring way too many parking spaces, or, you know, actually, it's pretty tight in some of these uh, apartment complexes we have. Um, have you had those discussions to even offer an opinion on that? No, not really. I, I've talked to a couple of the other planners. Um, I've talked to Buffalo Grove. I've talked to, um, let's see, who have I talked to? I've talked to a Mount Prospect planner. Um, mostly about um, how to calculate parking in a plan unit development in a transit oriented setting. So General parking requirement totally outside of a transit oriented area? No, we haven't really. Um. Okay.
Okay. We so gone through that, and and that we could do that. I mean, we can go through that with them. Um, I think what we what we started with was, you know, we're hearing we're hearing a, a repetitive complaint about us. It is from builders. From builders, we're hearing it every time. Um, they say, "I'm building this building in Vernon Hills." What is different about Vernon Hills than Wheeling? And uh, they don't have a train there. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. Is the complaint more about the number of parking stalls or the covered parking requirement or both? It's both. What we hear about the covered parking <clears throat> is that it cannot be paid for because it can't be used. Um, if you recall when uh, the, 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 the gentlemen from Kinsey who are looking at the Kinney construction property right here. They, they sampled covered rental parking in Wheeling to try to figure out what the right number was. Again, they have an interest in doing that, obviously, but what they came up with was not very many places had it. The ones that did offered it, the only way they could offer it was to separate it from the unit detach it from the unit so people could choose when to rent it and when not to rent it. They could not rent it attached to units. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't do it. So the only way they could rent it was on a monthly basis. So people in that particular complex rent it only in the winter and they park on the surface because it's, there yeah. is, there's, the dollar amount doesn't, it, it, you can't charge a low enough amount that people will choose to do it. I think we've got a number of separate issues here and a number of options and, and how to deal with them. There's covered parking, there's garages and carports, both under covered parking. <coughs> there's can we maybe separate apartment developments from owner-occupied condo developments? Now there, there would be more attraction and more likelihood of actually covered parking being an amenity that a condo owner would want. It is. I don't. I don't think legally you can. But I think oh. what what if I had a, if I had a panel of developers here, what I would guess that they would say is I can get it back in a condo, and I'll voluntarily build it when I believe I can get it back. What we hear about in the rental is they can't get it back. They can't build it. They'll get. The they can't. Don't they pay can't. For it. it has no impact on the rent they can charge, and therefore, uh, like we were saying, the. Even under the best case scenario, if they rent 100% of it for 30 years, so it's this just not. So only for rentals that you're having, hearing this? Well, again, we haven't had a condo developer come to us. Okay. Uh, but what I, what I would suspect a condo developer would say would be, I can sell it. I can sell a unit with, with parking attached to it. And they, what I, what I would guess without, you know, don't hold me to this, but I, I would guess that if you, if the, if the requirement were lowered to a lower ratio, um, you know, you take a, you know, 30% or something, if you, if you were to drop it down, I would imagine that the condos would probably be more likely to be above that number. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I think that needs to be looked at. And, and then I'd add too, right? I mean, how many how many apartment buildings have we had built in the past ten years in town? And how many condo how many apartment buildings have been converted to condos in the past ten years? And I know Just one, that, Mandalay. Is there two, more? Than two. Pine Hill, Fairway. Was Fairway condo? Fairway and uh, the one next to it. You know, and now now you're going to end up with the con a condo unit that doesn't have those amenities that we would like it to have. Yeah, and now do you have a tr trouble selling it as a condo versus when it was a <coughs> Well, those were converted after this requirement was on the books. I mean, they, they came in, they got the variations to do it. Um, but I mean, that that's the problem you face. I mean, and, and I hate to bring up the developers Dirty dozen. Oh, we can't possibly sell condominiums anymore. We have to make them apartments. Oh, and people won't pay for apartments uh, with all these amenities. So let's build apartments, and we say okay, and then they come back a couple of years later and say, oh, geez, well the apartments were nice, but we're going to convert them to condos. So, and now we're back 
yeah. where we were. I mean, on the on the other side of that, though, the developers who are building units in the neighboring communities of this type are telling us why they're not building them here, and, and whether they're being deceptive or not, it is a fact that they're not building it here. <laughs> but how do we? How, I mean, if they say they're building wherever, and they're they're saying it's an issue building here, how to how do we verify what they're saying is right? I mean, they could be telling us anything. We don't know that. I we mean, can, how do we? Yeah, let we us can go look to the, at what they're building the, and then invite them in and say. But uh, my we'll, point uh, exactly. They're not. You they're know, not rather than hiding just, what they're building. I mean, they tell they tell us where they are. We 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 can visit them. We can visit these locations. They exist. I mean, they certainly, the thing in Vernon Hills, uh, I mean, we can definitely go look at the places that are under construction. We we can contact the staffs. I'm, I, I'm just saying that the, the first round of this was multiple complaints about the same issue, or, well, the two issues, the overall ratio and the covered parking. And, you know, we went, we looked at the numbers to see, is there something to this? And um, what what I think the purpose of this exercise was for us was, okay, if there's something to it, what, what is it? What, what is it going to mean to a hypothetical development? All things being equal, you've got a development that, you know, Lake Cook Road is separating Buffalo Grove and Wheeling for the most part. I mean, they've got some down here too, but there, you could have five acres of land across the street from one another one is in one town, one is in the other, and, and you do your initial calculation of whether or not you want to buy a property, the land costs the same, it's got the same streets accessing it, and you determine that the construction on one is going to be $3 million more than the other one, that number is going to so far exceed the cost of that five acres of land that you're going to say, well, this is making a huge dent here. This is this is taking away from my ability to make money on this, and that's but, what they look at. But are we? What are we more interested in? Are we more interested in the developer making money, or are we more interested in what's best for our our village? Yeah, I, I don't I know mean, that the I, two it, are mutually exclusive. I think what I'm what I'm trying to determine, and I think what Miss um, Jones and I, I think might be able to determine if we do some additional work on this is can both of those things be satisfied? Can we do, uh, can, can we make modifications that attract exactly what you're trying to attract? Um, can we get, can we make a change that meets it halfway? You don't I don't want away. to lower my standards just to get something <coughs> to fill a space. Right. I'm, I'm not willing to, you know, do that. If we can achieve something that will still allow us to get and continue to keep the, the standard that we're looking for or achieve even greater than that. And, and I'd also like to make sure that we're really comparing apples mm -hmm. and apples and not other things, you know. Is the cost of construction in Lincolnshire more or less expensive than it is in Wheeling? Is the cost of land more or less expensive in Wheeling as it is in Lincolnshire? Right? Are, are taxes uh, higher or lower in Wheeling than Have other places? Have they got money from the village to offset you know, are, this? I mean, let, there's all kinds let, of. Let's compare it, all the, the variables sure. because exactly. if it's just. The easy way out, well, if we reduce the parking lot size by something, we could save an equal amount of money, you know. Andrew, I think you were about to uh, cite an example of something that maybe would meet halfway between satisfying the well, I don't think developer we know, and the code. I don't think we know exactly what it is. I think what I, what I was suggesting is that um, there, it may not necessarily mean lowering the standard. Sorry, this is loud. It may not mean lowering the standard uh, to achieve the the development that um, the village desires. We we may be able to attract the the building that you're looking to build. Um, it that building because it is um, because it is more likely now to be 
a one or two bedroom, a mix of one and two bedroom units. Uh, what I, I think, what I think you would see were that building to be constructed one or two bedrooms with the higher ratio, I, I would suspect that you would see a lot of empty parking at this point. Um, so I think what we're trying to figure out is, is there a way for a multifamily building, again, totally, totally separate from the townhomes, is there a way for the multifamily building, um, either in the MXT, out of the MXT, both, uh, is there something that we might be able to adjust that would increase the likelihood of development without also increasing a congestion problem or, or something else? Are, are the MXT requirements today the same as non-MXT? Yes. I mean, I, I would be willing to say that people who live next to a train station will probably use the train a lot more than somebody that lives in Brookville. Exactly. Okay, well, and that that there might be some delta that you could apply for <clears throat> maybe not not having to have as much re owner occupied parking versus guest guest parking i mean to lower that requirement a little bit if we had a train that ran 7 days a week i think it would be but I a only know of obvious. one family in our, our 25, only one person out of all 25, so there's basically two in each building, um, that actually takes the train and he walks to the train. Wow. One. How many cars does that family own? Two. Two. That, that's, that's the <laughs> point. And that's the point. That's what cars. I'm getting at. I, we, don't, we don't, in the suburbs, we do not use mass transit as primary transportation. That's correct. We don't even have a bus that runs on Sundays. Right. So we use we use cars. I'm granted mass transit during the week to get to and from work in the city is is good for an MXT. But when it comes to nights and weekends, if you've got a family, uh, a, a couple they're going to be going their separate ways. They're not going to go to the corner and get on the bus to go to the uh, to go shopping, to go to the fitness center, or anything. They're going to use a car, so they're going to need two cars. I, and I'm I, a bit reluctant to change anything in the MXT. I, I actually, I mean, I agree. I, based on my experience of how suburban transit-oriented development works, I think it's both. It's people who take the car, but then also drive. I, I, I think that that is something you probably see repeated. But I think what what the staff um, is looking at is can, is there a way to be closer, can we be closer to the, can we be more accurate in our, predict, our prediction of how many cars we're going to have? I think it's, when you look at this, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that somebody who lives in an efficiency isn't going to have 2.13 cars by themselves. True. So where where is the appropriate level? I, I think that's kind of what we're looking at is okay. assume people still drive. Is there a way to be a little more exact about how many cars per building there should be? So I, I, I think some analysis needs to be done there in the residential. Thank you. Okay. Well, what about, uh, we talked a lot about commercial. <coughs> I mean, is there, are there specific areas that we would like Andrew and Brooke to review? I th did we have any? Um, <laughs> Getting a workout. We took some notes. Uh, we do have some, and okay. we'll have the minutes of this. So we do, we do have some suggestions already okay, um, good. of what to look at. So how much time, Andrew, since... How much time would you need to come back to us with some um, possible updates to the parking requirements? Um, I mean, before I guess poorly, 
Um, what I'd like to do is speak <laughs> with some of the planners okay. and uh, development folks in these municipalities. We were looking at their codes. Maybe they apply their code differently than than we're interpreting it. So let's let's find out what's really happening. Let's find out um, the question of you know are these developments coming in uh, and asking for some type of plan unit development uh, just because we're being told it's being built. We need to know a little bit more about it. So that could take a little while. So then, what, um, what would you? We'll we'll check in. I, if we could check in maybe um, next month. Okay. Uh, in February and let you so, know what kind of progress we've made. We can work sure. on so let's go point. with um, update on the 14th. Valentine's Day, really? Oh, we have a meeting. Or, or even shoot for like a March 1st. I mean, give them some time. We can give you. Uh, we can check in and give, yeah. give you a progress report. Okay. How about um, <clears throat> March 14th? That's the first meeting, and that's two months. Yeah, we'll let you check know. in. Sure, we'll let you know how things are going. Okay. Yes. So this is this is basically, you know, a week to do this, right? Um, since last last Thursday night, oh. right? With our other stuff going on, <laughs> I I do have a concern, and and it really doesn't have anything to do with uh, the regulations because I think the Fresh Farms site is is beyond regulations I mean it's just very successful and we're going to have to uh, deal with it but but the question is it's got two vacant stores right now that according to your testimony last Thursday or whenever it was they have quote unquote plenty of room for additional special use type parking and I I don't know that they do, you know. And and the other thing is, you know, I, I think that site is very lucky to have the liquor barn. If you go in the liquor barn, oh. it's people are in and out real quick. Uh, I don't know how many of them are coming from the grocery store to go in, but it's a very big building with traffic that is very yeah. in and out right. and, and minimum. Had that been more populated, retail-oriented yeah, yeah, stores where you went in and shopped for a, a dress or whatever, had it been I think, a restaurant, had it been a restaurant, it would have been <laughs> even worse. But I mean, even a normal retail establishment that had a typical draw, I think that site would have been constrained. Uh, what do we do with the two? Out the two remaining buildings that uh, you know. You know the the parking requirement. You refer to the calculation that I referenced. It's it is going back to the the beginning of this an hour or so ago. The code is a good predictor of eventual demand. It's not a perfect predictor of eventual demand. Those spaces were allocated. Those two tenant spaces were allocated stalls in the original calculation. Uh, as I said, you know, I think we've learned from this that it is possible for a particular, it's possible for a retail store to have a higher employer, employee density um, than its um, the other stores in its cohort. So, um, would I would I do anything? Um, for those, or do they have? An, I, they still, the, the shopping center is still not at a point of requiring a variation. The number of employees per square foot is so high that they have had to purchase, they have to rent offsite parking for them now. So it's, it is a, it's a situation that I think now that the owner of the shopping center is in it as well. They are looking for solutions too. So I think it's something that is a solution is out there. I think they we've already started to see. Um, I don't know if you've visited it, but um, I've been by there a few times to see if it appears that it's working, and it certainly seems to be um, less congested than it has been. The street but, is certainly but, less but congested. But you freed up, for all practical purposes, let's say 25 parking spots. 
basically right. 40 40 it was, was the number that they have rented so what what is going to be the the parking allocation for <clears throat> the two extra retail think, stores that we, might come in i think they're total somewhere in the neighborhood of 15. each or i think they were allocated is that what they were but didn't they, so, so we'd they be they looking to put off the original they were but last week didn't they say that didn't i hear and maybe it's not true but I, this is what i heard that the 40 spaces that now ha have been moved over to Celadex were pulled off the street not pulled out of the parking lot so what we didn't do is we didn't eliminate any parking uh parking problems in the parking in the actual parking lot well there's only so now if that's um, the case we're, we're still right back to square one there's only about i mean if you add up the lineal footage of curb space in that area it's it's you know is not there's not 40 uh you know if we're talking about center avenue there's not 40 spaces on that street by itself um so probably some combination of the street um and as they said there are other businesses in the area that park on that street they were not the only business <coughs> parking on that street so uh, if, if you took 15 16 spaces on that street and say six of them are still uh, another business seven of them are still another business <coughs> You know, you move maybe 10, 11, 12 Fresh Farms employees um, off that street, and then the rest of that, you know, 28 would be out of the parking lot. I, I think that it, mi it might be a larger number um, than, um, than we would have guessed. Well, I think some analysis has to be done. Exactly. This is very, it's all very <laughs> new. That. It's very new for us. We right. haven't. It's only a couple of weeks old. Right. And the, and the two-hour restriction is not even in effect yet. But I, I guess the question is, in your based upon what you know today, do you think a restaurant or two could go into that center? I mean, obviously they what could. What kind of a restaurant are you talking about? No, I think they said 15 in total for the two, not 30. Did you say 15 in total for the two parking stalls? Yeah, yeah I think it, I, I mean I have to I don't have it in front of me, right? But, but it was not a huge number, right? Uh, yeah, they were they were originally calculated at five and a half per thousand on you know 1800 2000 square feet. So whatever that comes to <laughs> and then you reduce to about 20 maybe. and then reduce that by 25%. Yeah, that's, that was the, they were originally given. So that's total of just say 15 spots. for both spots for both spots. Yeah, that probably, as long as you got rid of 50 and you're adding 15, that probably might work out. Right, it might, yeah, exactly. Okay. And again, you know, the rest, there's a possibility that a restaurant doesn't necessarily operate on the peak hours of a grocery store um, without knowing which restaurant that is. We, we have had restaurants that had a, a expiration in their special use uh you know tied to their hours you know if they if, if the restaurant ceases to operate in this fashion uh the special use expires I mean, it's, it's been part of the review before okay good thank you um anything else on specifically parking okay you've got a couple of go do's um uh, since this other business is uh mr burns you have any other business um Mr. Stylin, you brought up the uh, the restaurant at the Weston um, development, uh, Twin Peaks. When again is that expected maybe to be uh, opened up? Yeah, any idea, Andrew? So I saw some kind of a March. banner out there. Yeah, I that thought I heard yeah. March 1st. But I thought it was right around March. I have not heard a specific date. It's very possible that they've got a... A date that I haven't heard. I, I believe there's a now hiring banner, but um, sounds like this spring. You know, anyway, huh? Yes, it is this spring. Yep. They said March 1st at the hearing. Is right. What I'm told. Yeah. So April or May. <laughs> I'm sure they'd. Li I'm sure they'd like to get in there around the NCAA tournament. I remember them saying that. Makes sense. <laughs> uh, everybody wants to get in the NCAA tournament. Right. So anything else, Mr. Burton? No, thank you. Mr. Johnson. 
Nothing, sir. Thank you. Mr. Dorvan? Uh, thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Andrew, for putting this together. It was yep. uh, Thanks for staying a away. good discussion. Thank you all. <laughs> Mr. Stalin? You found your pen, your marking pen? Uh, I do have a couple. I've got a backup. Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Brooke.